Hello, 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 and welcome. I'm Meryl Kalili, and this is DMTV. And today um, I'm speaking to Miriam Meyer, who's an activist with the environmental group in Germany called Letzte Generation, or Last Generation. And over this week, they've been gluing themselves to roads to block traffic in order to protest drilling in the North Sea and to get their Chancellor Olaf Scholz to listen on climate uh, action. So welcome, Miriam. Good to have you with us. Hi. Let's just set the scene a little bit. Who are you and what do you do? I'm Miriam. Uh, I'm 30 years old. And since the beginning of this year, I am part of the last generation in Germany. We are a climate group that is blocking roads mostly. German highways and getting arrested a lot. So I'm at the moment full time doing that. Gosh, full time getting arrested. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds crazy. Um, okay. Can you explain a little bit the, the climate picture? I mean, if I just woke up from a long cryogenic sleep, what would you tell me about the current situation that you're responding to now with your activism? Yeah, the current situation is pretty bad. Like, I remember when I learned it in school, in primary school, I learned about climate change and the greenhouse effect. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a problem. But surely you'll handle that. And surely I'll be dead long before these consequences will actually happen. And now we are seeing, oh, shit, we didn't act. We didn't act accordingly at all. And it's not not changing. And I'm just, what, what is happening around me? It feels... It feels insane that we are not taking this serious and that we are not acting accordingly. So we have one German cli climate scientist who says, it's like we are putting all our children into a global school bus that will crash with a likelihood of 98%. So that's the situation we are in. That's where I am completely panicking. And weirdly, I see people around me and I see politics not panicking, even though science is telling us to. I see people dying all over the planet. We had people die in Germany last year. We had a flood. 180 people died here in Germany. And I thought that will be the point where we in Germany wake up and see, oh, we have to act. This is actually hitting us now and not just people far away. But we're still not doing that. We are still looking for new fossil fuel infrastructure. We are still considering to drill for new oil in the North Sea. This is just crazy. There's so many crazy things going on. And I, yeah, I can't sit at home anymore and just watch that. It's just, it's, yeah, it's really, it's a really desperate situation. So what do you say to the various agreements, climate pledges, et cetera, that have been made by governments, uh, especially over the last few years on climate change? In Germany, we had... A one climate package. Uh, we had the Fridays for Future movement that was very big in Germany. So we had like uh, 1.4 million people on the streets and on one single day. And after that, we had a climate package from the government that was actually against our constitution. So we actually <laughs> had our const uh, constitutional court say that's against the German constitution. That's not doing enough. So that's what we got with peaceful demonstrations. We are still peaceful, but we have to heighten the pressure somehow because apparently just marching the streets wasn't enough. Then we have the Paris Agreement, which said, okay, we should reach 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees at most. And we just see that we are not doing that. Like we are at 1.2 degrees now. We will reach 1.5 degrees in uh, 2026 or 2030. And our German government is saying we will be carbon neutral and 2045. So it's just, it does work out. Our politics do not correspond with physics at the moment. So. Your group, Let's the Generation, well, the group that you're a part of, what are they asking of the German government? We have an international network, but the campaigns are in each country. They are a little different and it always depends on what that country is doing. So for us, um, at the moment, our demand is that uh, our chancellor, who wanted to become a climate chancellor, before he got elected, should stop even considering getting new oil out of the North Sea, because we think that's like the craziest idea ever. 
Um, and instead, we have to do things to save oil, to not use as much oil. And we want them to do like the easiest things, to have public transportation free. That's like an easy step. Of course, it costs some money, but it's an easy step to take. And it will save oil. Um, and to have a speed limit all over Germany, because at the moment we are burning loads of fossil fuels with our cars and a speed limit would just help to make it much less. So these are easy steps that we could take instead of drilling for new oil. A speed limit, uh, I mean, presumably that would depend on which roads. So, I mean, have you have you done the, the thinking around that proposal? I mean, are you asking for a reduction in... I don't know, take take 10 kilometers an hour off all the speed limit signs or what? What are you asking for exactly? <laughs> no, it, would, it would be more general. So it would be a certain speed limit for highways, one for like big roads between cities and one for um, within cities and uh, villages. So mm -hmm. it would be like three different speed limits that we would, would have all over the country. And then, of course, there would be some areas where you already have to go slower than that. So, um, right. so it would actually be a much easier system than at the moment. Tell me a little bit about the tactics that you're putting into play in order to get these demands met. They're a little controversial, a little risky, but what we've seen so far is in a relatively short space of time, um, quite effective in terms of getting, um, getting attention. Our basic idea is we cannot be ignored. We just don't have the time. We have two to three years to get this climate situation under control. So we can't be ignorable. We have to disturb ordinary people. That's what people really don't like about us because we are blocking highways. So we are not blocking politicians. We are just blocking random people. But what that does is it gives us so much attention because all of these people have to either be angry at us or support us, or, but we don't have like neutral bystanders. That just doesn't happen when you sit on a highway. So, um, yeah, we've been very successful in getting a lot of press, getting politics discussing about us. Of course, a lot about how we do it, but also about what we ask them to do. But it takes high risk from all the people involved. Mm. So, But take me yeah. through what literally what you're doing. I mean, you sit in front of cars, super gluing your hands to the asphalt so you can't be removed explain a bit about the playbook around that yeah okay so the playbook is we have small groups of people who get a certain like, coordinates for a place we, we kind of try to coordinate all our actions so that we can be most effective and then usually we do it in the morning so when all the people want to go to work and we take highway exits in Berlin we have a highway right through the city so there are a lot of highway exits all throughout Berlin. And there are usually just traffic lights at the end of that. So we wait for the cars to have red and they have to wait. And then we go on. We put on our orange vests and we take out our banners. We stand in front of the cars. And then it depends on how aggressive the cars are. So as soon as we see that a car is like coming too close or someone is getting out of the car and coming close, we will all just sit down to de-escalate the situation. And then we'll just sit there, try to de-escalate as much as we can. Sometimes Hold on, we get sorry. You, you, you'll sit down in front of the car that's trying to move forward to de-escalate? Yes. Okay. It sounds weird, but it works. So if I'm, if I'm standing in front of a car, I've, I've tested this basically. So if I'm standing in front of a car, the car thinks, well, she can go out of the way. She can move. So it will drive slowly towards me and try to get me to move out of the way. But as soon as I sit down, the car is like, yeah, she's not going to move. I, running people over is still not like pulling us off the streets is one thing, but running us over is another thing. So fortunately, that hasn't happened too much. We had one, one girl pushed by a car. She was still standing and couldn't mm. really get out of the way, but she's fine. So as soon as I sit down, I notice that the cars are like getting really frustrated, but they're stopping. That's, that's just, it works. And then right. also if, if people try to attack you, it's really de-escalating. If you sit down, they, they are less likely to like hit you or anything because you're suddenly out of their direct reach and uh, they can see that you're not fighting back. You're not, not aggressive towards them. So it really helps. But where does the super glue come in? 
because you you just you you sit down immediately in front of the cars as soon as there's a red light. How do you have time to super glue yourself to the asphalt, or is that in is that a different tactic? So that's what we do when the police arrives. So we have to be really quick with that because the police also, of course, kind of know when we will do that. So they will try to get us before we can glue ourselves. Yeah, we just for safety reasons usually we wait for the police to come because they won't pull us off if we are glued. Well, they sometimes do, but because Usually because not. it will rip your skin. It won't rip your skin off. It's just your hand will really burn for hours. So mm-hmm. yeah, if they rip you off, you'll just have a completely red hand and it will just burn. Yeah, so we do that as soon as the police arrives. So you will just see it, all of us, except for some people who are leaving an emergency passage. So some people will just sit there and not glue themselves. So if an, there's an emergency, those people can get up and the rest will glue themselves, just put super glue on the hand, put it on the street. At the moment, the streets are really hot, so that's a mm. challenge. And then mm. as soon as we are glued, we're basically set. Like that's Then the police takes over. This tactic of blocking roads, it's been a few months. Explain the timeline a bit. Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. So we started blocking roads actually with a different demand at the end of January. That was our first campaign where we blocked roads. Before that, we had a hunger strike. So we had some people who were in hunger strike before the elections and they, their demand was to get a conversation, public conversation with the candidates. And the they federal of elections in Germany um, for, the, for the chancellor and yeah. Olaf Scholz ended up winning it. Go on. Yeah. And after his election, he had to talk with them for an hour and it's, uh, yeah, it's a public recording. It was live streamed and everything. Right. Um, and those people then went all over Germany and gave talks. And that's how I joined the campaign. And then in the end of January, we started with blocking highways. So the, those two people who were hunger striking, he spoke with them for an hour. It was a public meeting, live streamed. What was the conclusion from that? Well, for me personally, the conclusion was that Olaf Scholz is not going to save us. Like It was so clear that he either he hasn't realized the situation we are in, or he just doesn't want to deal with it. I don't know. It's it's really hard for me to grasp because I feel like mm. also for him as a chancellor, just for his personal benefit, it would be nice to not have a climate catastrophe happen. Mm. Like it's, I don't really get why he's not ready to deal with it. But it was just so clear that he thinks that we are just fanatics. And um, yeah. Yes, and, and he certainly... Uh, doesn't approve of these tactics uh, about a month ago he compared climate activists to nazis yeah <laughs> that was a nice moment yeah i think that was another moment where i was like okay he is definitely not the climate chancellor that he promised us he would be mm. like i i never had much hope because yeah i know what he did before he became chancellor and it was not very promising but at the same time i feel like it at least showed us that we are really annoying him. Like we are at least mm. succeeding in getting to him somehow. So that was nice. And and I guess that kind of energized your group when they heard that. Explain to me the reactions so far, the roadblocks. What about the institutions? What about decision makers? What have they said so far about these protests? How have they reacted? It depends. So in the First phase in January, we had some people at the beginning from the Green Party approving of it, and then they got a lot of hate for that and they took it back. <laughs> but now, a few days ago, we had the mayor of the district, uh, the B- district of Berlin, in which our locate was, come by actually and give us her solidarity. And now the the mayor of all of Berlin is already <laughs> against that. So we're already succeeding in a lot of debate. Um, yeah, the police and the justice system are just kind of overwhelmed. Like they, they are just not keeping up anymore. I have mm. barely received any letters from what I did back in February. So it will all take ages for them to like catch up with the paperwork uh-huh. and everything. I've read some of the coverage. There's various narratives and I, I'd like your reaction to it. The first is that... <sighs> That these young climate activists think that they know better than a democratically elected government and they should better be doing something else. What would you respond to that? Well, first of all, we're not that young. We are. We have an age band from, well, now since, since yesterday, um, we had a 12-year-old on the road and our oldest is 73. So we, we have quite a, an age group 
just something for everyone. Um, I mean, the 73 year old does it for his grandkids. So, um, yeah. I forgot the rest of the question. We should be leaving this to our democratically elected government who is aware of the problems of climate change and and we're giving them the, the power to, through our democracy, to, to handle this problem that affects us all. Yeah, and I wish that would work. We still want to stay within democracy with all our demands and everything. So there's not any point where we are like, let's just do what we say. But we can just see that even though we have a democracy and we have elected our leaders, they're not doing that basic job. Their basic job is to protect us. Their basic job is to make sure that we are fine, that we don't have a hunger crisis, that we don't have people dying from storms or floods, that we don't have wars. We can see them not doing their basic job. And that's where I feel like, okay, that we have to stand up. We can't just watch and we can't wait four years for the next election and hope that that will somehow... Um, make it better. It doesn't matter which party is in the government. That's their basic job. <laughs> like the Green okay. Party, of course, but also the other parties have to protect us. That's well. Yeah. The the other criticism that's often leveled at climate activists, and it's it's resurfaced again with in reaction to the, the protests that you're engaging in now, is that these are working people that you're blocking uh, from getting to work. They could be pregnant women trying to get to the hospital. Uh, and this kind of protest, if it hasn't yet, you've been lucky, but it, it could really negatively affect people. So how would you react to that? Yeah, there's always a risk. Like we, we are trying to make this as safe as possible. We don't want to endanger anyone. So that's why we always have a way for emergencies to get through. Of course, the cars and the traffic jam also have to make a way for them to get through, but that's what they should do anyways. And if that's so dangerous, then we should have a system that has makes sure that there are no traffic jams in Germany, because we are not the major cause of traffic jams in Germany. <laughs> We're just adding a few. So for me, it's really hard to sit on the street. It's really hard for me to tell people no when they want to get through. If they're angry, I can deal with it better. If they are desperate, it's really tough. I feel very sorry for every person I'm blocking there. I just don't see any other way. And the climate crisis is not going to choose who, who it will hit. It's, it's like it's also going to hit all of us at random. So Let me just take the devil's advocate position a, a little bit here. It's fair what you say, but to the person that's trying to get through to the hospital, perhaps in a car, not an ambulance, uh, further back from the front where you guys are and they're just sitting there beeping the horn, what would you say to them, if that were to happen, uh, what would your reaction be? Just that I'm very sorry. That's We're trying everything for that not to happen. And I really hope we won't ever hurt anyone with our protest. I don't see any other way. It's just, okay. I don't see any way where I can have the same effect, the same impact without having some risk, without disturbing random people. I wish we had another way. Okay. Now I'm looking at uh, some statistics. September 2021, YouGov, this is in Britain, but they were asking people their opinion on Extinction Rebellion, the climate action group there. And 49% were fairly negative or very negative of Extinction Rebellion. Do you believe that it's strategic to polarize people against activists like this? I mean, if they, it's one thing to say that they are they are talking about us, and that's a good thing. But if they're talking about you in a way which is like, God, I, these people just just make me insane. Is that really going to change hearts and minds with regard to the climate crisis from people? The thing is, they. They are, of course, a lot of people are against us, against our methods, against what we do. But what we can also see is that not many people are against our demands. So what we hear a lot on the streets is, yeah, that's fine what you're asking for, but not in this way. Like they, they hate the way we do it, but they don't hate what we want. And I don't think anyone, well, there might be someone who was just saying, just because they want this and I don't like them now, I'm against it. <laughs> but usually what we can see is that there's a lot of support for our demands, even though there's not for our methods. 
And at the end, that's what matters. It, it doesn't matter if they hate us. I mean, of course, it's horrible. Like, I, I don't read comments anyway. But as, as long as they agree with the demands, as long as they discuss our demands as well. Well, and that is something that in all the coverage I've read so far on this, your demands are always there. I mean, they're forced to explain what it is that these people want. So it certainly is a platform to to present your demands. You've said that people are willing to go to prison for this. That is a, an enormous burden on any activist, an enormous risk that could affect people's futures in a very dramatic way in the short term. How would you explain that feeling that you have and and that your fellow activists have that you're willing to just do anything for this i don't have much to lose of course for me personally i could try to like have a good future for now and uh like have a nice life until the climate crisis hits but i feel like i have the opportunity to do and try something i am in a democratic country where i can so I don't want to like wait until it really hits me personally. And yeah, I feel like what future am I fighting for? Like if the thing is, if I spend my future in prison, but I've tried everything for our entire planet to have a good future, I'm willing to take that. I'm willing to spend time in prison for that because that's just so much more important than my personal record. Like, of course, I'll, I'll have a criminal record. Sure. I mean, Maybe at some time in the future, that will be a good thing. Maybe that will be the thing that gets you the job. (laughs) But um, yeah, it's not fun. Like being in custody is not fun. I've spent way too much time in custody and I hate that I have to do that. But I just feel like, yeah, what future am I fighting for? Am I fighting for my personal, trying to have as good as a life as possible under the circumstances future? Or am I fighting for a better future for all of us? That might suck for me personally. And sometimes it brings you physical harm as well, this. I mean, the pain grips that the police sometimes use, they recently carried away a 15-year-old in a pain grip after uh, taking them away uh, from their superglue. This is painful, it's difficult. How do you feel about that? How does your family feel about that? Yeah, it's difficult. It's I, I really hate pain grips. <laughs> like, that's, because you, you usually know that they're coming and it's like, it's just, yeah. But still, I don't want to get up. I just, I just can't. I, sh- I can't just get up because they are threatening to do pain grips. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot. Like this is an emotional roller coaster. It's really exhausting. We have been, mm. been in action in Berlin again now for a week, and it seems like three months at least. <laughs> like <laughs> it's, it's really a lot. My family is kind of, yeah, mostly fine with it. My parents do support what I do here, but no one wants to see their daughter go to prison or their daughter be carried away in pain grips or in handcuffs or, yeah, it's not. But explain to me how Let's the Generation, Last Generation, has mobilized a group of such hardcore activists so quickly. Explain a bit about the training, the legal advice, the way it's organized because I see a, a very media savvy group here that understand communications. And, and I think that they're not making many of the mistakes that other groups have made in this space. It's not a very preachy group. It's very action oriented. There are very specific demands. You, you go onto the website, they're immediately, okay, we've got a Zoom call every Thursday and every Sunday, join us. It's it's all about getting people onto the streets. It's not about, here's our analysis and we've got to have this talk. That's my take as an outsider, but explain how it is from the inside and how they've managed to achieve that. Yeah, I think that's just a lot of inspiration from people who are willing to risk so much. So for me, that were the people in the hunger strike. I saw the people in the hunger strike and I was like, wow, these people are actually risking everything. They risk to die for our future. And that was something that really inspired me. And I also realized we can do something because they got all the media attention. They actually managed to get their demand and have our chancellor talk to them. So I felt like, okay, we can actually do something. We can actually achieve something. And then... 
what we do is we kind of alternate between an action phase and a mobilization phase. So of course the mobilization also runs throughout the action phase, but not at full speed because most of us are in action. <laughs> so what we do is that the people who go into action, glue themselves to the streets, get taken into custody, they go back to their places. So I will go back to Northern Germany and there they will do the mobilization. So then we will hang posters, uh, pass up leaflets, try to get as many people as possible to come to our talks. We have online talks uh, at the beginning mostly because of COVID and now we have both online talks and talks in various cities. So sometimes you will just see on the website uh, for one day, there will be like 50 talks in different cities at the same time. And we're trying to get as many people as possible there. And then what we try to do in the talks is basically to connect emotionally to what the climate crisis means, because that's the factor that will actually get us moving, get us into action. And then we invite the people to training. You also have a maybe meeting, like an in-between step where you can go to an online meeting and just ask all your questions. and Maybe um, meeting. Yeah, that's for all the people who maybe want to join I, the campaign. I like that. So it's a sort of last generation curious. People. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then we try to get as many people as possible to come to trainings. We have those once a week in every region. Those trainings, they're online and offline, right? Yeah. And who's giving them? Who's involved in this? Is it people who have just figured it out by themselves or people who have been out there doing this and have got results and and are sharing their stories? Mostly everyone just learns what needs to be done. It's kind of the spirit. <laughs> so if if the, someone needs to give a talk, then someone will learn to give this talk. And if um, we need someone to do a training, someone will learn how to do this training. So we have a training script that is, of course, oriented on other uh, nonviolent direct action trainings and de-escalation trainings and everything. So we just had some people have a workforce and basically create our training that we want to give to people for this campaign. And then we have a training script that everyone who wants to give a training can access. And there's a lot of information on how to do it. Of course, we have done the training ourselves. So we kind of know what happens in there. That's literally the tactical training what to do in order to block the roads how about the legal stuff like how yeah. do you understand um so the legal yeah we have we have a basic legal training within the direct action training where you will learn a little bit but we also have an extra online legal training there's also a recording of that you can watch it. you can't make it live and we, then we have also q a sessions where you can ask our legal team or someone from our legal team will answer all of your questions Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we have specific cases that are not in the basic training. Yeah. This is a group which is only about six months old, right? It's kind of organized itself very, very quickly. How many people are involved so far and in, in, in the core group and the wider membership? Oh, yeah. I, I'm kind of losing the overview. So we had three people who started this campaign, like our core team, and who are still making like, the most basic decisions in terms of strategy and, um, yeah. But then, of course, at the beginning, they did mostly everything else as well. So, like, the legal team at the beginning was one person. Um, that was actually a different person from those three. But, yeah, they they did a lot. And now what we have is, like, basically, we already had the structure of different work groups. But they were mostly just one person. And now we're just adding more people to all of those groups. So and how many people are we talking about? Sorry, in terms of like the actual volunteers who are really mobilizing and energizing the wider membership? That's a difficult question. So I think in like the strategy stuff, we might have like in all the legal stuff and all of these uh, work groups, we might have about 30 people. Mm. And then we have way more we're just like doing the mobilization everywhere and coordinating okay. that there's an article last week about progressive groups in the u.s in the intercept and it explains how these groups are basically imploding because of too much internal discussion because of demands for horizontality from the wider membership but you just said that three people are, are making the most basic decisions how has the group managed that problem which affects so many progressive groups that everybody wants to have a say and sometimes in order to actually have a group that has action 
there needs to be an element of verticality as well. How do you negotiate that tension? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a tricky part, uh, and, and that's also like probably yeah the most difficult part for some of us. We have a lot of ways to give input, so it's not like these people are making decisions and then ordering us to do anything. <laughs> like that's not happening. We have a feedback process where we can always give back all all the feedback that we have from our group. And there are, yeah, by now there are way more people involved in the strategy than just these three. Yeah, I think we need that to be as efficient as we are. Because I, I've, I've done some stuff with Extinction Rebellion uh, before. And when you have a certain amount of people <laughs> that want to make a decision together, it will take ages. And what we are doing mm. at the moment is blocking streets every day. So we have to, like, we have to be very efficient so yeah sometimes we will i think we had like nine or ten yeah ten blockades on one day mm. at the same time so coordinating that is just yeah you can only do with that with some centralization and then basically our our strategy is to say okay we have a team that makes the basic decisions and you kind of you have to go along with that if you want to join you can of course quit at any time you don't have to mm. ever do anything there's always, if you're not happy with something in action, there's always some people who are like, oh, I can do support instead because I don't want mm -hmm. to give my ID or something. Do you yeah. think the fact that you, you're you such an action-oriented group avoids a lot of those problems that plague progressive groups because there's much more action, it seems, than talk in your group, or at least action plus preparing for action? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think we are all just, all the people who are here are really like, they just want to start doing stuff. You can really mm. feel that energy. So mm. there's so many people are just like, okay, let's just do something. And I, I feel like all of these people don't want to go into a group where you have to make plans for three weeks to do one action or mm. to, where, where you feel like you're spending most of your time discussing stuff. Um, yeah, they just want to get started. And mm. I think for that, this group is perfect because you can really just, you can, you could join in three days. You can like go to a talk, go to a training. We had, we literally had people just, <laughs> just be on the street the, the next week. So. And it's growing, right? I mean, when yeah. people see this, they get, as I understand it, the numbers are, are increasing a lot. Okay. Let me ask you some, I mean, personally, you weren't always an activist, right? You studied Buddhism and you went to Kathmandu and your family are, have always been into ecological issues. I mean, explain a bit about your background and what, what made you get active. Yeah. So yeah, I was, I studied Buddhism in Kathmandu in Nepal and yeah, I think my idea was always to do something on the lines of activism. Like uh, I thought about human rights in Tibet a lot. I thought I would end up there, um, some NGO fighting for that. But then at some point I just realized, okay, if we don't get the climate crisis under control, human rights are going to go downhill globally on a catastrophic level. So I just feel like this is the most important thing we have to deal with. And this is the one thing where I really need it. But I never thought that I would have this life like I never thought I would spend time in custody I never thought I would even have any issues with the police and now that's like my my day-to-day -day. it's like just another day on the street another day talking to the police another day being in a cell so that's kind of crazy but I also feel like it's the the one useful thing to do at the moment and I feel like for, before that I was very desperate like I had this I think many of us had this phase of just crying about the climate crisis because it feels like no mm. one is doing anything and it's it's so bad and it's only getting worse so now being active and at least trying everything makes me feel way better it's so and much then, of it comes down to time doesn't it like the ability to to dedicate time to those trainings and then to to be there and on blocking the roads how would you respond to someone that says, look, I want to get involved, but I don't have the space or the time. And it seems like Miriam's really fortunate to be able to do this, but it doesn't work for all of us. Yeah, and it doesn't have to. Like if all the people who can do it, do it, that's great. There are so many ways to help our campaign. Like you can, like just donating money, of course, but also helping in the background, like doing media work 
or all the support system that we have. We couldn't do this without our support system. Like mm -hmm. That is just managing accommodations for us or have food for everyone. Like we have a group that cooks and brings food for everyone in the evening. And they're just doing all that for free, right? I mean, or, or this is based on donations that you've crowdfunded from your site. It really depends on how much you need. We basically have this, if you say, well, I want to work full time for you, but I can't because I have to go to work. Then we can say, okay, we can basically support you enough to still do it because we need people and we will get the money from somewhere. And then we have a lot of people who just do it in their free time. And also you don't have to be the hardcore, I will go to prison person. We have, we have some of those and those are a force that is basically unstoppable, like sure. But we also have a lot of people who just come by for two days. Then you're less likely to have a criminal record. It won't be as expensive probably afterwards. Mm -hmm. You can somewhat gain this experience. And we also see a lot of people who do something in support and then suddenly end up on the streets. <laughs> so there's like a, <laughs> once you are involved with a campaign, a lot of people end up blocking roads at some point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but you can, you can help us in so many ways. It sounds like you enjoy what you're doing even though it's for a very serious and uh, serious cause. Tell me a bit about, about that, about the connections between people and working together. Yeah, I think if there's one good thing about the climate crisis, it's probably that I've met these people <laughs> because it's just, it's such an amazing group of people, people who are willing to go to jail or at least custody or like sacrifice a lot of their personal well-being to help all of us so that's just an amazing group of people that's like a family feeling after now we have a lot of new people and the first time i'm like who are all of all of these people and the second time we are all hugging and just being in action together and being in those situations really connects you quickly yeah so it's it's very rewarding on that yeah okay if I would like to get involved with let's the generation last generation what are the points of contact and things that you would recommend i would recommend to just go to one of our talks that's like the first step to get to know us we also have recordings of the talks given that by different people <laughs> i think mm -hmm. we have an entire playlist now yeah so just that's like the entry point of course you can also join in a different way some people just go straight to trainings or something but yeah just come to the talk to get a better idea of what we're doing and then see how you can help and okay. if you want to be part of it and the last question for you, if there are two or three books that you could recommend for people listening, like it could be in the area that we're discussing now or, or something totally different, but two or three books that you would suggest. Okay, that's an interesting question. So I think my favorite book and then one that motivates me a lot is Buddhist book. So it's uh, by Shanti Deva the Bodhicaya Avatara that kind of talks about the Bodhisattva motivation. And I don't think I'm anywhere close to that, but it's definitely an inspiration to like see how you can give up everything for others. Yeah. So that's one of my strongest motivations. Okay. The title of it, I didn't get the title. It's, it's yeah. Called... <laughs> Bodhicaya Avatara. In oh, English, the... it would be Introduction to the Way of the Bodhisattva or something like okay. that. Okay. 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 Anything else that you would like to to add? Yeah, since, since this is in English, um, just to let everyone know these campaigns are everywhere. There are so many countries who are building these campaigns and there is so much help. So if you want to start a campaign in your country and there's no campaign already, there is international exchange calls where you can hear from other countries what works, what doesn't. And you really only need a few dedicated people in the beginning to start mm -hmm. this. And then you can grow quickly and yeah, really have some impact. We also have some people visiting here from other countries, like we have a group of Czech people in action with us and some from Denmark who also want to do the same thing in their countries. So don't hesitate too much. Like, but If you feel like you have no idea how to do all of this, there's a lot of help. Like you can, you can really get, get a good start um, with this international exchange. Okay. Thank you very much, Miriam Meyer. It's been interesting talking to you and best of luck with the protests. Thank you.